the automated podcast. So, it has been a few weeks since the last episode. I actually had to move once the lockdown conditions loosened a bit here in Barcelona. And really the amount of paperwork and organization that was required to move during this special period was much more time consuming than I originally expected. So I was unfortunately not able to focus on any new podcast episodes. But the podcast will definitely continue now as I finally settled into my new apartment. So in an earlier episode, I discussed some of the initial trends and technologies that were relevant to the themes of the podcast that were being impacted by the COVID phenomenon right before the lockdown here in Barcelona and much of the West started. So this focused on robots, AI, drones, etc. being used to actually fight the virus in hospitals or for tracking certain cases. So a number of my guests have also spoken to how the crisis will impact the specific areas they presented. And I think now as we are seeing the world start to move out of this lockdown period, I thought it was really timely to revisit this theme as we can perhaps start to see long-term signs of our post-virus future already today. So whether we see a resurgence in a second or third wave of this virus, I think that the trends are really uh, well established now to identify more solid future scenarios, which we can talk about in the podcast today. So the first, and I think the most obvious change, deals with the remote aspect of work. So clearly the stay-at-home orders across the world have forced many organizations to adopt these new remote working practices and also adjust how work is done to stay productive. So Zoom was actually one of the popular choices and I'm sure as many of you know, they went from 10 million to 300 million users in just a few months. And similar increases in tools like Slack or Microsoft Teams were also seen. So I think it is also interesting to note that uh, when certain ICT tools were built in the Internet's early days, this kind of remote working reality was in fact a vision for many of the early adopters. But it has really taken a global crisis to enforce a reality that has actually been possible for several years already. So now, of course, all work won't automatically see a full shift to being remote long term. But as the possibility is now more known, it can become a more probable course of action for many businesses and individuals. So, for example, uh, Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey has come out recently saying that some Twitter and Square employees can actually work remotely permanently. And though other high-tech Silicon Valley firms have said uh, similar things, their policies are uh, less open. But I think it can be expected that this trend will continue for organizations across the world as we have gotten used to doing so. And of course, the infrastructure is now there to enable the significant proportions of the population to actually undertake this remote work. So uh, an interesting fact here is that the server market actually grew 30% in the first quarter of 2020 compared to the 2019 growth. So I think that the infrastructure really is there and, of course, will continue to be laid out for uh, larger and larger proportions of uh, our populations to continually work remotely for the long term. I think it's also understandable that uh, without a vaccine, many countries may experience a second and even third wave, potentially reinforcing the stay at home orders, which would further solidify a remote working lifestyle. So really linked to remote work, we have seen an explosion of virtual reality usage. So personally, I've used a lot of VR during this two month quarantine to go to conferences, events, and even visit, uh, in air quotes, nature environments, which has always been a big part of my life uh, before the quarantine, of course. So with uh, the increase in remote work, the level of immersion and interaction with colleagues and friends definitely decreases. So VR really enables an increased sense of presence, which promotes the effective exchange of ideas and knowledge, which is really essential to the 21st century type of work that many of us are doing. So I've read many examples of product designers uh, specifically using VR to assemble their teams to work together through the entire process of generating a new design, even full-scale vehicle designs. 
So I think that with our continuing remote work paradigm, as VR technology improves, becomes more affordable, and of course widespread, it is really possible that a substantial proportion of the future of work takes place in a virtual world. So apart from the impact on jobs, I think it'll be quite interesting to note the influence on other obvious candidates, such as transportation, real estate, and events, as uh, many large and small business events have shifted from uh, the physical to a full virtual experience with varying but often high degrees of success. So moving on to uh, more automation focused trends. So I think that with uh, social distancing in place, and the need to restructure workplaces to of course minimize human contact, we have seen several examples of automation being accelerated across various sectors, especially in the uh, essential services domains. So in the previous coronavirus episode, I talked about numerous examples of robots being used in hospitals to either uh, deliver supplies or even disinfect parts of the hospital to reduce the strain on the healthcare workers. So an example within the waste industry, however, is uh, AMP Robotics, which actually offers AI-empowered robots to sift through recycled material to identify and weed out uh, different sorts of trash. So they claim that the demand for their products significantly increased in the uh, early days of the crisis, even in facilities that already had one to two robots installed. I'll have an interesting image of the different waste pieces being identified uh, by the AI system in the show notes if you're interested to see, of course. Furthermore, we have, of course, seen extensive use of drones as delivery bots during the lockdowns. And this has really reduced the risk to delivery personnel as a substantial increase in delivery demand occurred during this period. So though a number of urban and rural pilots were already in place before the crisis, these efforts were usually plagued with large numbers of safety regulations, as well as legislative barriers, effectively not allowing any large scale implementations to occur uh, outside of China. But with the crisis, a number of these barriers have actually dissolved. So I can list off a couple examples here. So the Federal Aviation Authority in the U.S. has noted that the lack of air traffic at present makes the use of drones relatively less risky, which is why it is granting drone flight waivers to help with the COVID-19 response. Uh, Similarly, in the U.K., India, and Sri Lanka, uh, CAAs are also making it easy to deploy drones in response to the pandemic. So in the specific case of the UK, the CAA is setting up air corridors where drone flying rules are relaxed to enable um, the drones to deliver goods during the coronavirus pandemic and beyond, which I think is interesting. So companies like uh, Wing, Flytrex and Zipline, which I've spoken about on the podcast before, have also increased their services during the lockdown to offer medicine, food and household goods. So I think that it is quite likely that we will see the use of drones for delivery at a considerably accelerated pace as time goes on. So moving on from the idea of automation, uh, one of the kind of natural segues, uh, which I've discussed on the podcast before, is the basic income schemes, uh, which are really making a resurgence now uh, throughout the coronavirus pandemic. So I do think that this is something that won't be implemented right away, especially on a national level and to the full extent that has been discussed in the previous episode. Um, But this Black Swan event has radically altered the perception of UBI for many people across the world. So I would say that it has even become a major idea that is present now compared to a more fringe idea touted and debated by only a relatively small minority of the population. But uh, during this crisis, we have seen a few examples of countries starting to seriously consider uh, UBI. But as of yet, there hasn't been a full scale rollout. But actually, most recently here in Spain, only on this past Saturday, the government announced a $3 billion UBI scheme for the most hard hit households due to the virus. 
Again, this is a limited implementation and can't be necessarily declared as universal, but it does seem to be a step in the direction towards a full program. So I think that uh, as we are seeing an increase in automation, specifically job elimination due to this pandemic and the stay at home and social distancing enforcement, we will continue to see UBI discussions becoming more and more relevant as well as with greater frequency as time goes on. And highly connected to UBI is the implementation of a digital currency. So last month in the US, as part of a future uh, UBI package for individuals impacted by the crisis, it was actually proposed that monetary relief is typically a challenge to give out due to the different levels of banking access for those people that are impacted, as well as, of course, uh, as the speed of the mail checks. Thus, uh, the UBI payments would be issued in part through a digital dollar through something called a Fed account, which could be accessed in various locations like banks or post offices across the country. So essentially, a federal digital wallet would be created for certain individuals where digital currency uh, could be instantly sent, skipping the check printing or wire transfer process. So though this is unclear whether this will actually go forward completely and at what time, uh, I think that the crisis has possibly opened the path for a digital currency to be introduced in the current largest economy of the world, as well as potentially other places in the West. That being said, in China, it is already somewhat of a reality. So in four urban areas, uh, including uh, Shenzhen, um, a digital yuan will be trialed with nearly 40 million people. So it will be used mainly for transportation, uh, some retail purchases, as well as being issued to a large number of government officials. So I think the interesting point to note in both of these examples and the idea to really kind of think about as these examples go forward and they're actually piloted is whether this digital currency will enable the same level of anonymity as cash does today. I think that there was some discussion of this for the uh, US example, but I am considerably more skeptical for the China example. But I guess time will tell. So finally, I think that uh, we can close on this idea. Uh, awareness of global crises and their extreme impact on the livelihood of everyone has been raised to a much higher level than at any other time in perhaps the last several decades. So many are already speaking and writing about the positive future consequences of what this will mean for climate change mediation efforts, as well as other well-known future crises. Although I hope this is very true, I also think that these last few months will make us all more mindful of any crisis that we can identify beforehand, which I really hope benefits the discussion around automation and what it means for the years ahead. So thanks for listening to this week's episode. If you want to support the podcast, you can leave a like or a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you want to get in touch, feel free to do so over Twitter or LinkedIn by searching for Automated Podcast. On the website, automatedpodcast.org, you can leave a comment on any of the episodes, read the transcripts, and look at the sources I use in all of these episodes. There are also blog articles and additional resources and information on this topic and podcast if you are looking for more. See you next week. The Automated Podcast.